Why don't you go ahead and open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 33. And with the title uh, this morning called, uh, you know, Warning slash Hope. And what I'm really meaning by that, I just feel a real tension in my spirit about, uh, you know, as the lead pastor, how do I communicate a, you know, warning about the, the serious times we are in, and at the same time, uh, not create any fear, but actually create hope for the future. Uh, so I want to start with Ezekiel 33 in, in verses 1 through 6. And it says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to your countrymen, and say to them, when I bring a sword against a land, and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman, and he sees a sword coming against the land, and he blows a trumpet to warn the people, then anyone who hears the trumpet but does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes his life, his blood will be on his own head. Since he heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take warning, his blood will be on his own head. If he had taken warning, he would have saved himself. But if the watchman sees the sword coming, and he does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and takes the life of one of them, that man will be taken away because of his sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for his blood. So as I go on that warning sign uh, side of the, of the ledger, uh, I feel that, for the most part, most of us in here have not really been affected by what's been going on, whether it's the COVID or whether it's the, the financial situation that's going on. But I think before this is all over, all of us will be affected one degree or another, especially probably financially. Um, I think the next several months are going to be very... Uh, going to be a lot of shaking going on. Uh, I don't think things are going to get better in the short term. And I think, again, we will all, we will all be affected to some degree. I, uh, I was listening to last night, not listening, I was actually reading <clears throat> something Rick Joyner had said, because I've heard different, you know, prophetic people kind of give their viewpoint of what's going on and what the future looks like. And, and uh, Rick was saying that he that from his viewpoint, he had saw that what he calls uh, the next civil war, using that term, not necessarily as a, a physical civil war, but a civil war coming to the United States that he knew that from many years ago. But he always thought it was decades in the future. And then he, he now realizes that it is now actually now. This is the time of that happening. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of turmoil. There's going to be a lot of shakings, a lot of other things be going on. But his viewpoint is, in the long term, that the republic will be saved, uh, and at the end, it will turn out well. There's some others who don't necessarily see the same thing, but they don't necessarily see how it's turning out. I don't know how it's going to turn out. It's like Lonnie was mentioning the election. I don't know how the election is going to turn out. I do kind of uh, agree with, with what Lonnie said, that it's probably the most important uh, election since the Civil War. Uh, and as Glenn was mentioning, uh, on the Democratic side, uh, Franklin Graham just this, this week had said that, that uh, Biden and Harris would be the, the, the most pro-abortion candidates to ever run for an office. Or, or for the office of presidency. So, yeah, it is a huge thing that's coming. And so I think all of us are going to be affected in some way. I like to say for the vast majority of us yet, maybe we have not been affected, but we will be. Now, Jeremiah, uh, turn to Jeremiah chapter 8. So go back to one book to Jeremiah. Sometimes we'll call him the weeping prophet. Jeremiah, I'll make that Jeremiah 18. 
And we're going to look at verses 7 through 10. And this is the Lord speaking to uh, Jeremiah. And he says that if at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, tore down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended for it. So if a nation I warn repents of evil, then I will relent. So my question always has been, you know, really to the Lord, how many? How many does it take? How much of the church? How much of, you know, because actually Chronicles, Second Chronicles tells us that it's, the, it's God's people who are to humble themselves and to pray. Are we seeing a response to what's going on in the church? Are we seeing people cry out for mercy and grace for the nation or, or people interceding for the nation? It's interesting in Jeremiah's case, uh, you know, he, he prophesied for 41 years before Jerusalem fell. So for 41 years, he's up there warning people, this is what's coming. So it's not like God lost his temper all of a sudden and goes, all right, that's it. He warned for 41 years, Can you, how would you like to be Jeremiah? You're giving that message over and over again, and hardly anybody is listening. Nobody is paying attention. Life just keeps going on until 586 B.C. when the Babylonians came in and basically wiped out Jerusalem. Those who, the survivors were taken captive and made slaves and, and sent into Babylon. Now, it's interesting that a judgment even like that is not a, it's not a personal judgment. It's not a personal judgment on you, but we can be affected by it. When the nation is judged, we can also be affected by it. At the same time, if you think about, like in that case, people like Daniel, the three Hebrew children, they were just youth at the time. They were taken captive as slaves into Babylon. But look what the Lord did. He ended up raising up Daniel till he was a, the second most powerful man in the Babylonian Empire. So God has ways, even in the midst of judgment, to bless his people. Let's go to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, and we're going to go to verse uh, 25 through 29. Okay, verse 25 says, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he promised once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The word once more indicates the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what remains cannot be shaken. Therefore, since we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire." So you think about what God's doing in the earth, 
you know, Isaiah says, in the book Isaiah, it says that when God's judgments are in the earth, people learn righteousness. But what about for the Christian? What does that shaking do to, do to us, or what a, a positive effect should it have upon us? I think one thing is to remove false comforts. If you think about when stress comes upon you, what do you, what do you, what do you gravitate towards? What do you find as something that I would call a false comfort? You know, there's obvious things like, you know, maybe it's alcohol, you know, uh, self-medication in some way. Or maybe it's even something like food. But something that, that when, when stress comes that you're drawn to and you kind of draw into that place because it brings you comfort, but it's really a false comfort. And I think God wants to shake those things away from us so that our true comfort is the comforter. It is the Lord. Another thing I think he wants to is, is to remove anything that hinders our love for the Lord. You know, the first great commandment is that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our soul. So it removes some of those other props so that we are focused upon him. Because some of these false comforts are being removed. In Matthew chapter 24, many of you are probably already familiar with that scripture, but that's kind of the end times uh, scripture out of Matthew, where it talks about the signs of the times. I'm not going to go through all that except just, just to read a little portion of verse 4 through 8. And as Jesus is speaking to his disciples, in verse 4, he says, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of war, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Now, that word nation against nation is also ethnos, which means basically ethnic groups against each other. So it can be actual nations, and it can actually be within our nation ethnic groups. But it says all these are just the beginning of birth pains. And we've kind of talked about the birth pains before, how they, how they happen, that that with, in the beginning, the, the, the contractions are, are very mild, and there's a long period of time between the contractions. And then as time goes on, the contractions begin to increase in intensity and also increase in length of time is becomes closer and closer together. And so Jesus has given us this picture of the end of the age. What happens? These things begin to happen, and you begin to watch them, and they begin become more and more uh, intense, and then also there's a shorter time, a respite between the two. And so as we begin to watch, we begin to pray, we just watch the signs. And that's what I always say, you know, watch and pray. Watch what's happening, pray, and the Lord will give you insight. And again, as we talked about this, this coming election, I think is, is a huge event, um, and it's something I think we need to pray about. And, of course, we need to cast our votes, but we also need to pray and intercede. Uh, because personally, my, uh, my fear is if this election is lost, there may never be a going back. Because usually what we say is, well, you know, the pendulum swings one way and it swings the other way the next election. My, my fear is that it will not swing back, that we may be on a course that we can't correct. But in all that, there's hope. So part of my, again, my, my purpose is to kind of awaken you to the fact that, yeah, things may get darker than they are now. Things may be more shaken in the, in the coming months than we're even seeing now. But there's great hope within that. And if you're not shocked by when those things happen, then you're ready. You're prepared. You're spiritually ready 
knowing that, yeah, I expected these things, they're coming, they're going to happen. And again, that doesn't mean it's the end of the age. It just means that this is a, a, a time period where we're going into something that could be very dark. But in John chapter 16, so what's our response? What do we, spiritually, what do we do? Go to John chapter 16. You know, Glenn and I used to uh, actually teach uh, preparedness. Uh, we did that for several years quite a few years, and, uh, and like I would do water purification, and she did a lot of things about food and because and, there was a lot of interest in that. Uh, we did it with some church groups. We did it with individuals. We did it with actually in a group in Austin, Texas, uh, which is called the Austin Disaster uh, Relief Network, which has like 175 churches that work together in responding to disasters. They would have us come down at their conferences and, and do some teaching. But what we found out as time went on, we, we found out people were looking too much at the physical preparation, and they weren't looking at the spiritual, the most important part of it. They, people wanted a list, tell me what to do, and I'll get it, and weren't really correcting their hearts or getting their hearts set towards the Lord. And so as we look at John chapter 16... And verse 33, and it's a short verse, and Jesus says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace, that's shalom. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we take heart in that, that no matter what's happened, and uh, this, I'm reading out of the NIV today, but it says, in the world you have trouble. If you read, I think the EAS, it will say, which is what I usually study at home, uh, it says tribulation. But it's talking about two different levels. One level, just in your everyday life, without anything else going on in the world or in the nation, if you live very long, you know you're going to have trouble. There are troubling times that come personally in your life. And he says, take heart that I have overcome the world. And the same thing on a bigger scale, if it's something like we're talking about with times of shaking, that we take heart knowing that none of this has taken the Lord by surprise. He knew it was coming. We We may be surprised by it all, but he is not surprised. And he has a plan and he has a purpose in all that shaking. You don't have to turn there, but, you know, in Isaiah 60 where it talks about, you know, when great gross darkness covers the people, arise and shine. Because the light is so much brighter in those times. And your light will shine that much brighter in times of when the darkness is increasing upon the earth. And we need to see... Again, from heaven's perspective, to try to get the Lord's perspective of what's happening, what's going on. Because this, this isn't just about our nation. It's about the nations of the world. This is a worldwide thing going on. And so it affects nations across the world. And so our question needs to be with the Lord. Okay, Lord, what are you doing? What is my part in it? And he has answers for us. You know, back on, on going back to the election, I think one thing that we have to be aware of, if this election is lost, I think we as a church, as the church as a whole, at least those who uphold the authority of scriptures, need to prepare for persecution. Because there are going to be people who will not uh, stand for what the word says. If we say uh, a marriage is between a man and a woman... If we say God created man and male and female, then we will be eventually persecuted. We will be say we are hate you know haters. We are whatever, uh, and I think it could get very bad. Where at some point we'll have to make a decision: do we stand on the word or not? And many will not. So anyway, that's a sideline. But it's in that context of shaking, 
Those times when things are shaken, when there's chaos, is when revival breaks forth. So we're praying or asking the Lord to send a fresh move of the Spirit, a revival in His church first, and then asking the Lord for a third great awakening for this nation. Twice in our history, we have reached points like this, and God intervened and turned the nation back. And so we're praying, we're asking the Lord for that, that he would do it, that perhaps he would leave behind a blessing. Another thing is, you know, again, don't turn there, but Proverbs 13, 22, you know, says, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. And, you know, I've heard that for many years. Uh, Never seen it really. I mean, maybe in individual cases I've seen that, but not as a whole that we've seen that. And it may be this time when that happens, when everything economically is shaking. I mean, when we as a nation are now $30 trillion in debt, how can, how can we get out without having not just inflation, but, but most likely I would say hyperinflation coming? But within that, the Lord has ways. He has ways to reveal, give us creative understanding, give us creative ideas, revelations of things of how we are to, to, uh, to come out on the upside of that. You know, like many people say sometimes that, you know, wealth is never destroyed. It just changes hands. Okay? So how do you get on the upside of that equation? It's something we can ask the Lord about and believe that he's going to give us the answer. Another thing I believe is coming, uh, and I don't really know if this is the time for it, uh, things we call safe places or places of refuge. And again, I don't know if we're at, uh, in the short term if we're to that place. But there will be a time where God will provide safe places, places of refuge where people can come and there will be safety and they'll be provided for. Uh, some people use the term cities of refuge. I really, uh, don't like that term just because if you go back into the Old Testament, there were cities of refuge, but it was a whole different concept. It's where the manslayer went to certain cities. So... That could be confusing to people. But again, I'm not going to touch on that. That could be a whole nother time, a time, another place when it becomes, when it's time. But there will be places of refuge. There will be safe places. Uh, First Chronicles 22:33 says, The men of Issachar who understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. So we need to be like the men of Issachar who knew the times, who knew the seasons, and understood what to do. In other words, understood what your response needs to be. How can you be a blessing during that time when everything else is in chaos, everything else is shaken? Again, that, that, that precludes us to be asking the Lord for revelation, and to be like the men of Issachar. And personally, what we do, since we're in John, let's go to John chapter 15. Spiritually, what do we do? How do we, uh, what's our response supposed to be during these times? So in chapter 15 of John, Gospel of John, 1 through 5, Jesus says, I am the true vine. And my father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. 
apart from me, you can do nothing. So one of the secrets is to abide in Jesus. When everything else is shaking, we dive deeper into the Lord. And that word remains, or some versions will say abide, meaning basically just to live in his presence, to be connected to him, us in him and him in us. And so our focus becomes on Jesus, and we are not shaken. Now, during those times, and I talked about, okay, what happens when the money's good? What happens when the money's not so good? Philippians, turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10 through 13. And, of course, Paul is writing this to the, the church at Philippi, but he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content. Whatever the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So regardless of what's going on, whether it's the good times, the bad times, the shaking, you're without, you're with, you're blessed, you're abundant, or whether you're lacking, the secret to contentment is that I can do all things through him who strengthens me, that we can find that contentment. And that contentment can only come through the Lord. Now, since we're speaking of, of contentment, turn over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And verses 6 through 10. And as Paul is telling Timothy, he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we bought nothing, we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And I might add shelter, food, clothing, shelter. That's pretty basic things. You, we, he said, we will be content. So I think we have a, a big uh, gap between needs and wants. I want a lot of things. I don't necessarily need a lot of things. And I think as, as we live in probably the most affluent time in human history, we have grown used to lots of stuff. Not necessarily needs, but wants. And so we always have to kind of separate those two out. What do we really need and what's just our desire, what's our want? And one last scripture, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Again, that's regarding contentment. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? So again, it's not about whether you have money or whether you don't have money. It's about the love of money, if we go back. That leads to all, all sorts of, of actually sin. So be content with what you have. 
But all in this change of season, the positive things, and other some more positive things are, you know, if you look at uh, Acts chapter, you don't turn there, but Acts chapter 1, verse 1, it says that Jesus began to do and to teach. Throughout, throughout most of our Christian experience in the Western world, it's been about teaching and sometimes a little doing, but not a lot of doing. And by doing, I mean the miracles. I mean the, the, the John 14, 12 that says, where Jesus says, the works that I do, you shall do, and even greater works shall you do because I go to the Father. We have never seen that fulfilled yet. That is yet in front of us. And so that's part of the things that should be so exciting to us that we're going to see great, marvelous, extraordinary miracles. And so we're making that, be making that switch from beginning to teach and do to begin to do and to teach. Teaching is good, but we need to, it, it needs to be reached out and touched and people's lives changed through miracles. Now, with all this going on, you know, and the things that yet, are, I think, you know, I don't know how it's all going to turn out, but I, I do feel completely confident the next several months are going to be very troubling. But if you think about it, the Lord knew you would be alive at this time. So while it may be taking us by surprise, it's not taking him by surprise. And he has a plan, he has a purpose, and we might be thinking, well, you know, that, that really kind of messed up my plan of how I, I had things laid out with what the future was going to be and what I was going to be doing, and it does, you know, and it's interrupting my plans. But again, God knows that you'd be here, that you'd be alive, that you'd be part of this, and he has a purpose and he has a plan for your life. And if we go back to the, you know, the, the teaching out of 1 Corinthians, you know, about that we're, we're all part of a body. Some of us may be a hand, some of us may be a foot, some of us may be a mouth, but we're all part of a body. We all have a purpose. We all, we all have giftings. We all have giftings that other people don't have. And it's, it's when that whole body is functioning together that we're effective. And so I don't want, again, to, to leave uh, any doubt that I don't want anybody to be fearful. I just want people to be prepared, knowing that things are coming. They're coming our way. But the light is going to outshine the darkness. And if you are ready, and if you are prepared, and if you are abiding in the Lord... You're going to be fine. Yeah, you may be touched. Things may change in your life, but that's all right because it's, the exchange is going to be worth it. The Lord is going to use you powerfully and anoint you. And to use an old, uh, old Testament expression, it says, you know, it was repeated several times, it says, gird up your loins and be prepared for the greatest day of church history. There's going to be some great things coming our way, powerful times coming our way. So it's in that midst, it's in that context of shakings, of chaos, that revival comes. And again, people who maybe you have tried to witness to for years and really would never give you the time of day, weren't, weren't, you know, weren't in, interested at all in God, didn't want to talk about it, all of a sudden they have ears and they're coming to you and they're asking questions. What's going on? You know, what's the answer? So be prepared to be used. Be prepared for not to be shocked when things take place, but to be, just get back with the Lord. Okay, Lord, what are you doing? What, what do you want me to do? Just be asking the Lord. And also interceding, interceding for our nation. It's a time where we need to be interceding for this election. We need to be interceding for the nation as a whole that God would have mercy upon us and would turn this whole situation around. So be encouraged. But again, it's, it's, that, it's that slash. It, it's warning, but it's also hope. Hope for the future. Things may look, not look like what you thought they were going to be. And again, your plans may be interrupted, but it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it in the Lord. So let's go ahead and stand.
So, Lord, we just thank you for this day. And, Lord, we thank you what you are doing across this nation. And, Lord, we welcome your dealings. And, Lord, as we want to be a people who have clean hands and a pure heart, and, Lord, I just ask if there's any, Lord, anything in us, if there's any false comforts that we fall back upon, Lord, that you would reveal them to us, Lord, that we might deal with them. Lord, help us, Lord, to abide in you. Lord, what does that look like for each of us, Lord? How do we, how do we connect with you and, and truly live in you? How do we, Lord, walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh? How do we have eyes to see and ears to hear what you're saying, what you're doing? So, Lord, I ask even now, Lord, that you would give this people visions and dreams. Lord, that you give them creative ideas. And, Lord, that your peace, your shalom would rest upon them, Lord. We just bind any fear in Jesus' name. And we just speak, Lord, your grace and your peace that surpasses all understanding. And, Lord, we pray for those this morning, Lord. We have uh, several, Lord, who are, Lord, sick. We ask even now, Lord, that you would stretch forth your hands and you would touch their bodies right now, Lord. That any fever, we rebuke that fever in Jesus' name. We rebuke any infection in Jesus' name. We pray for healing and strength for bodies, Lord, because there's no distance in the spirit. So we ask for your healing hand to go forth right now. And that you would touch them, Lord. And, Lord, that next week they would be back here in the house of the Lord, worshiping the Lord. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you're doing. We embrace your shakings. And I just ask, Lord, that you would prepare us, that you'd give us again those eyes to see and ears to hear what you're doing and what you're saying. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, another thing to pray is something Glenn and I pray all the time, is that, that we would be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. So timing is, is critical during this, this season, upcoming season, that you're in the right place.